it's been really exciting to see his early entry into adulthood come with so much autonomy and personhood um, where he self-reported feeling a lack of those things upon entering Brooklyn Free School. And one of the things that he said at graduation that I'll, I'll never forget because it felt like an absolution for, for me as I'm learning to undo adultism. Mm. And he said, my time at Brooklyn Free School, though short because he transferred from another school environment too, which was, I think, why it felt so welcoming to kind of join along with him. He said, during my time here, I never thought I could learn to love myself as much as I have. Wow. This is the Agentic Schools Podcast, where you will learn about schools from around the world where children's agency to make decisions about their learning and living is more important than their academic skills. I'm your host, Don Berg. <laughs> Hello and welcome. Uh, to the Agentic Schools podcast. I am here with Courtney McClellan of the Brooklyn, Brooklyn Free School. Um, so in order to get started, we'll, we'll get to details later, but, but I just want to start with, and I love to start with this I- idea of, tell us a story of a student or a family or, or somebody who really sucked the marrow out of your school, of what you have to offer, so in a good way, and like, like getting the most value, but just really taking advantage of what you have to offer. Oh, what a great question. Um, I, the first student that comes to mind is uh, Milos, mm. and um, he just recently graduated from Brooklyn Free School. I should note that I'm fairly new to the community. This is mm. only my third academic year touching in with them, and um, m- what I feel like is our first kind of normalized year since mm. the pandemic, or at least our normalized school year start. Um, and Milo was incredibly instrumental um, in welcoming me. To, mm. into the school community. Um, and though I didn't work directly with his age group and, and his, his class, which at our school we call advisories, um, mm. I did have the opportunity to um, host him as an intern mm. uh, for some of his senior prep work. And he did a technology internship with us um, and supported uh, some of the needs that the school had around maintaining our website and um, kind of cross integrating some of our digitized, newly digitized systems. And um, through that process, so alongside some of the other um, digital practices that I think dovetail nicely with that work, including photography and um, you know, individual tech support for, for classrooms, just the, the little things. Um, he really got to interact with the whole school, um, all the way from our youngest students, our, our early childhood age uh, students, to um, administrators and board members in order to pull together information that was necessary to, to uh, support our processes and, and the completion of his internship. And so he was doing a lot of multi-age interacting. Um, mm-hmm. And we met once a week um, to, to talk about how things were going, to check in on resources and needs, and um, to, to make sure that the internship was mutually beneficial. And through that process, uh, Milo began discovering things that were important to him, things Mm. that he wanted to continue doing, um, special projects that he thought were going to be beneficial not only for his schooling, but for the improvement of his school environment as he made his way to college. And Mm. um, he's been back in touch with us uh, all summer and into the start of the fall for him. it's been really exciting to see his early entry into adulthood come with so much autonomy and personhood um, where he self-reported feeling a lack of those things upon entering Brooklyn Free School. Um, 
And one of the things that he said at graduation that I'll, I'll never forget because it felt like an absolution for, for me as I'm learning to undo adultism. Mm. And he said, my time at Brooklyn Free School, though short because he transferred from another school environment too, which was, I think, why it felt so welcoming to kind of join along with him. He said, during my time here, I never thought I could learn to love myself as much as I have. Wow. And it it didn't feel like necessarily a marker of any kind of, ooh, pat yourselves on the back or success from our school environment, but it felt um, more like a calling yeah. um, for us to continue to find the niche for students that have um, unique passions and to create spaces where those can grow um, and uh, an opportunity for us to thank students like Milo for giving us the gift of uh, feedback mm -hmm. in multiple meaningful ways um, but to share something so personal and so deep um, in such a broad and public way was a gift. Yeah. Um, young people are so often, I think, told that their worlds are not important and that we, um, we should be expecting them to step into our world. So for them to, to open up that honestly about what's going on inside of them um, and to believe that people care enough to level with their their experiences and understand them and um, and to hear them in a way that that you can honor those experiences it truly is a gift and he yeah, should yeah. that with us so. that is great um, so I, I really appreciate that distinction between sort of sharing authentically versus sort of sharing that that sort of like oh yeah we yeah we did this great thing um but but there's that there's and then that's a that's an important part of getting at a deeper understanding of what schools are about is that there's that there's sort of when you think about it in academics you sort of think of like okay well i just went through the motions and i i did the thing but i didn't really learn deeply what was going on um, and then I think there's a parallel to that of, of sort of, here's what we do as a school, and it's, it's, it's the thing, you know, the kids go on to great things, or is it something where the kids actually find something truly and meaningfully deep, deeply moving about themselves, about the environment, that there's a relationship and there's an interaction. And like you said, he's coming back, and, you know, there's ways that, you know, um, you're not the first person who's told that story of somebody who really connected and then found the opportunity to like, wow, this really is a community to be part of and continue to be part of um, over time. Um, so so let's, let's give them a little, give, give our audience a little bit of the, the, the details about, you know, what the, what the school is and how it operates, uh, kind of the broad overview, you know, if you're talking to the random stranger, how do you explain what you do? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, explaining what I do is a little bit trickier than I think explaining what the school does. So I'll start there. Um, mm -hmm. we're, we're Brooklyn Free School. We're located in, in the heart of Bed-Stuy at Restoration Plaza on uh, Fulton Avenue, sorry, Fulton, Fulton Street. And um, we've been there since January of this year. We are a democratic free school with a social justice mission, and uh, we serve a K to 12 age population, though we're non graded both in class structure and in, um, in academic scoring and assessment. And uh, we provide narrative assessment opportunities for our young people and we pride ourselves on multi-age classrooms that support interge intergenerational learning and socialization. Um, we 
uh, we are tuition based, although we have a sliding scale fee that um, that is need based, and we have recently uh, during the pandemic and and, and post pandemic changed leadership um, structures mm. and um, staff majorities along uh, along racial lines. Mm. Uh, and gender lines and so we've gone from um from since our school's founding about 20 years ago um from mostly white male um, executive leadership and, and board leadership to um black female uh leadership and um and 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 black uh, educators in the classroom um we are still a, a very diverse staff uh both ethnically racially religiously, um, economically, um, and, uh, and that is so that we can reflect our student and family populations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's always a, a, you know, another follow-up I ask is, is about the kind of the community you're serving um, and, 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 you know, what does that look like? What, for, for y'all, what is what is that, how does that show up? Like, who's showing up to you for you as a school in your community? Uh, our, our community uh, is very, very Brooklyn-based, very, very New York-based. Obviously, um, we, we get a lot of, of local uh, families finding us. Um, we, we do have a few families that commute from different boroughs, uh, from, from Queens and from Manhattan, but for the most part, our family mm -hmm. populations are centered in Brooklyn, though we are a private school, and, and obviously, you know, folks can can come to us if, should they like. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, we we range um, socioeconomically. Uh, mm -hmm. That uh, our families do take advantage of that that the range of sliding scale tuition options, which we're really proud to have gotten down to three. Um, mm. through a fax process, through their admissions application. Um, we do an assessment. We, we do both, both a, a numerical assessment, but also a, a verbal um, mm. assessment. Assessment sounds so dry uh, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> to describe that process. It's more like a conversation that's going to enable the family to have agency as well in their educational mm -hmm. choices for their young people. Um, and we, we, really, we really do try to honor that um, and also offer um, in-kind exchanges in order to support mm. that sliding scale tuition, we we do not thrive without support from our community, and we're very clear about that as we intake our families. We, if if you're if you're joining us, we have the expectation and the hope and the gratitude that you're going to join us in the classroom. You're going to join us on field trips. You're going to join us in the board meeting. Um, mm -hmm. You're you're going to join us in the after school program. Um, and, uh, and, and we welcome that. Um, we've had so many beautiful guest teaching opportunities from parents in the past, special projects, um, in kind exchanges for, for other internships that takes our, take our students outside of, of the school. Um, and that strengthens who we are. Um, I, I come from a Montessori background. Um, a bit. I'm I'm not uh, Montessori trained, but most of my um, experiences in teaching in the classroom mm. beyond teaching artistry were in Montessori schools. And um, at a Bencher Montessori school in Nashville, Tennessee, I learned the value of the triangle that connects student school. And family mm. and the necessity for that of that for the holistic care of the student um, and the continuity of their learning environments mirroring mm. each other home and school and so being involved with families is not just an ask that helps us keep our school running it's a necessity for us to be in deeper community with our young people that we understand what their 
what their home environment is like, what their family expectations are, um, you know, how how their worlds are shaped on on all sides, um, how they want to shape them both at home and at school, and particularly at school in, in an environment where that's supposed to be, they are supposed to own it. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Where they, they spend most of their time, most of their free waking time um, in a space, they should be able to, to shape that and mm-hmm. when we learn um, what what their what their other environments where they do have agent more agency um, are are like, we can we can um, structure ours uh, accordingly. Right, right, and and that's one of the, that naturally segues into another question I'm always asking about the particularly the free schools is that uh, there's sort of um, some misunderstanding in the world uh, that that there's a lack of structure in in free schools and in, and the way I like to say it is that that there's a different structure um, but there's no such thing as human beings without structure the question is not structure or not structure it's which structure matters and so talk to you know give us a sense of of the kind of structuring you have in your in your space because when you say free school and you're emphasizing a lot of freedom um, what do you mean by that? Like, what, 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 what are the really important structures that make your school operate and, and work well? Mm-hmm. I, off the top, um, I'd say our meeting structures are one of the most important parts of of how we shape the environment and and offer agency to young people, um, and we follow a democratic meeting structure. Um, where appropriate um, hmm. and that looks that that looks like uh, two different types of meetings um, off the top most readily and that's our whole school democratic meeting structure where um, governance is 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 turned over to the to the young people in order to make decisions around the school that have anything to do with um, the the environment, um, the the ways in which um, we are learning, and um, and and the tools that we bring in to help them learn, um, mm-hmm. and the only areas that are excluded from from those conversational opportunities are the areas of hiring and firing, safety, mm-hmm. and uh, and and school structure and longevity through finance, mm-hmm. okay. which and you pre- presumably a legal board has to correct manage that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we we turn those over to the, to those groups. Um, mm-hmm. But besides mm-hmm. that, anything else? Um, we encourage our young people. That's a great idea. Bring it to the democratic meeting, and right. let's give right. you a platform so that you can discuss it with the school. Um, mm-hmm. We also mirror our whole school democratic. Um, meetings uh, into our individual advisories. Um, mm. So each each classroom, each class group, uh, has the opportunity to have smaller uh, democratic meeting structures in order to make decisions that are applicable to their age group. Mm. And mm-hmm. then the third is using um, circle circle practice for restorative mm. justice. Um, uh, yeah. In place of what people traditionally may think of as disciplinary action or um, mandates. And right. we use those opportunities um, and and conversational segues in between in order to create community agreements with one another, which are living and flexible documents. And the more that we learn, um, the, the more that we add to and amend those structures. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Very cool. Yeah, that's one of the things that 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 has been, emphasi- you know, kind of a theme in a lot of the the school the, the the people I've talked to, is that is that living structure piece is that uh, there isn't a crystallized 
you know, form that everything's going to take or that everything is going to come out in this particular way. It's not, it's not, a, it's not Robert Rules of Order and you have to have a book that, that tells you exactly what it is. It's something that's renegotiated and, and that's an aspect of the agency, not only of the young people, but of the adults as well, is, is that we are in conversation, we're negotiating who we are and how we are together. Um, and, and I mean, you just pointed out yourself that, that, that the entire organization has gone through a big shift and, and a transformation, and it's now different than it was. Um, but that's, that's the amazing thing about these kinds of institutions, is that they can make these amazing transformations and, and, and do it in a way that doesn't... Um, denigrate what came before. It doesn't say that was, you know, something wrong. It's just that we're not that anyway. That yeah, we're <laughs> we're this now, <laughs> whatever this is. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think that's a really good, uh, it, an important part of understanding how, what it means to have demo demo democratic structure, democratic process is that, and, and I, I, uh, you know, I've made the point in a book about, you know, it's not just that the school influences a child, the child has an influence and accepts influence and responsibility for the school. So I think you, you use the word ownership, um, that they own the school, and, and that's a really crucial part of it, um, is that they have a sense that who I am matters here, and so when I show up and, and you know, it may, you know, it, conflict happens, I don't have to disappear into a conflict or be overwhelmed by that conflict, but I can use it as an opportunity to learn, oh, uh, in some cases it might be like, oh, I didn't want to be that person, but I was for that moment, and we can move on from that. Or it can be like, hey, you know, I don't want you to be that person right now. <laughs> you know, something's going on here. Um, but that's where I really feel the, the restorative justice in particular is a term that's being used in some contexts in more traditional schools in ways where there's a mm, less deep understanding because the structures that they have available are not as clearly enabling of that type of like like when you're in a structure that is not about conversation it's about dictation or you know there's there's a there's an authority here and they have to exercise that authority that's a different conversation to have restorative justice within a, a democratic structure that's the nature of what we're doing. That's, that's how you define your school is these democratic structures. And then that's, restorative justice almost flows, out, you would like to think <laughs> that it flows out of that. But now you've had to be deliberate about that. I, I, I know that in the democratic movement in a larger sense, a lot of people say, oh, there's some ways we can refine, and that's, once again, the dynamism. We have to, you know, we, maybe we weren't doing it as well as we could have before. Maybe some people, you know, but, but we have the democratic structure itself says we're not perfect, but we can get better. <laughs> um, and, leaves, and leaves the room for that to be the conversation and to be what can happen. So um, one of the things I, I, I want to, each school has unique shall we say, jargon or code words that they develop. And, and you're new to the Brooklyn Free School, so, so what are some of the jargons or, or, or you know, free school speak that, that you became, like, discovered there, that you think, that the ones that you think are really good, that, like, the world would benefit if they used this, you know, took on these terms or this jargon or whatever? Oh, gosh. <laughs> There's so many. Um, I think the, the first things that come to mind are actually more physical language or body language mm. um, that that we use in our democratic meeting uh, meetings to save to save a little bit of space for for more conversation and um, and also enable different learners learners who have varied ways of intaking information to also participate um, and those are number one. One of our most favorite things that you'll see at Brooklyn Free School is people doing this. 
And uh, for those of you who are listening more than you're than you're visualizing, I'm I'm just wiggling my fingers um, at mm-hmm. at, the, at the camera here, um, and that's to to signify agreement with something that someone is saying. Mm. Um, and so when um, when someone's making a really impassioned point that resonates with lots of people in a meeting, you'll see a lot of jazz lot hands. Of, you'll yeah, see a lot of yeah. wiggling fingers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. a lot of a, a, alongside a, a lot of smiles. Um, uh, another another physical tool that we work with our young people, and they they love this one. This one's also a popular one. Um, Ooh. Uh, this is this looks like a, a a bit of a Spider-Man web. Oh, okay. That I'm I doing know. with my with my fingers, or if you're if you're more used to Focus Fox, it kind of it, it looks oh, right. like that flipped <laughs> flipped down. Um, but that's to that's to say I have a direct response to something oh. that someone is saying. Mm -hmm. And it also means that you can jump in front of someone who may be raising their hand in order to indicate um, a new topic or a new a new thread on the Mm. current conversation. Um, And that also helps it it is helped uh, with this particular symbol, which if you're if you're a JC follower at all looks a little (laughs) rock. I'm throwing up the, the rock symbol, but it's to indicate a point huh. of order. Uh, oh, okay. Say, I think we might have skipped something important, or um, I'm pretty sure we should take a vote now instead of asking for a new proposal. And so mm. our students um, use this in order to help us help us guide the, the structure of the meeting. Yeah, I think I've learned it sort of as a as making a triangle with your thumb and four fingers, mm. and it's called delta. So it's you know some kind of change. Mm-hmm. That's what I think I learned. Similar use, it sounds like. Uh, for me, coming especially coming from some more traditional uh, college environments, that's 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 huge. I went to an HBCU, mm-hmm. and that mm-hmm. was that symbol I first learned was for um, an organization called Delta Sigma Theta. Um, oh prides themselves on, you know, cultural responsiveness and change, but obviously, um, you know, our mathematics teach us that as well. Mm -hmm. Um, And so when I, when I saw the symbol, that was immediately what I, what I thought of as well. Um, Most of our students, it's, it looks a little bit more like a diamond. (laughs) They're they're squishing it up a little bit. (laughs) Just so. Um, But, but for us, it, it indicates, I have a point of order to okay. uh, to put out or or something that I'd like for us to get back on track with mm-hmm. that's that's useful um, and then yeah. uh, the last is uh, is is a call and response that mm-hmm. our executive director uses and so do all of our advisors um, often when we're in large groups in order to get attention and, and the call and response is not new in, in communal <laughs> Uh, communal organizing for sure Um, but what I like about ours is that it is also reflective of part of our social justice mission and Mm. the the shift that um, that our young people and our educators um, were bringing to the community and asking um, for change and a push in a direction that was more again reflective and culturally responsive to who they were where their homes are and who who they say are Mm. their people um and and that's the phrase i'll go Mm. and the response is ame um essentially it means it's it's an agreement i see you Mm. And um, when we when we see each other, it means we're we're ready we're ready to listen we're ready to attend, um, mm-hmm. and and we're ready to, to move forward together. Right on, right on, very cool. Um, so one of the things that that, that I also want to touch on, um, we, we it's kind of circling back in a way when thinking about that triangle, you know, the family, the home. Uh, in the school and the child um, is that there when when people are coming to your community um, a lot of them probably don't know don't have a background in democratic education and so what are some of the either you know, just sort of mythologies either specific to democratic schools but or just education mythologies that that um, that you find challenging 
um, in your context? I think you you spoke it earlier. Um, one of the biggest, and it's it was a question that that I asked uh, just before I signed my name on the dotted line of my contract, <laughs> which was to say, you know, where is where is the structure? What mm. does that what does that look like? Um, and for me, it was where does freedom meet structure? Mm. Where do the two where do the two meet one another? And it is it is challenging um, because freedom looks different. Freedom can look a lot of different ways, and mm -hmm. that means that there's there's unfortunately we have to throw out the idea that one size fits all. Yeah. Um, each student, each family, each teacher, each faculty member, each board member uh, has a different need for the, the amount of freedom and structure mm. that's going to enable them to define their own success. And so com the communal aspect is incredibly important because I think in order to, to meet the challenges of how much freedom and structure to provide, you have to get to know the person mm -hmm. deeply um, as related to what work you want to get done together. Mm -hmm. uh, and that takes presence. But um, we are challenged in, in this post pandemic world, I think all of us are all all of us as individuals and um, as communities and organizations <clears throat> with resourcing time. Yeah. Um, the world tells us there's no time for that. There's no time to get to know people deeply. There's no time to create new and or individualized structures mm -hmm. um, that meet people where they are. There is no time to let people be free. Yeah. And <laughs> you, I think you also pointed it out earlier that it's, it's a choice to prioritize mm -hmm. that. And wildly, my experiences have shown me that when you do prioritize the getting that getting to know yourself and other people um, deeply, that the time takes care of itself. Things go very quickly <laughs> when you can skip over insecurities and fear and 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 secret pockets of hate that mm. we don't all realize we're masking with our biases. And when you can dig deeply into those and you can be honest about them for yourself, mm -hmm. um, it gives others an opportunity to be honest for themselves as well, to meet you in the middle and to, to really get to the heart of it. What, what is it that we're doing? What are we talking about here? What's happening here? Mm -hmm. um, so that we can agree to the structure that best supports the group. Mm -hmm. and it's yeah, hard. yeah. So it, it comes back to the, the, the structuring is uh, unique to the who's who's showing up, mm -hmm. who's being present, um, and 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 then in a way you can think about the educative process as um, our learning to be present, stay present, um, and and you know and th this is where the you know, kids have a lot to offer to the adults um, in their way about presence. Um, is it, it is very much a dialogue in that there's, we just have the more baggage in dealing with it. <laughs> um, so they have their access to presence that is unique to youth. <laughs> um, but then we have a sort of uh, larger perspective on on the deeper causes of what's preventing us from being present. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, I like that, that way of thinking about it. Um, be, because we, 
we can we can really honor that they're that well, the, the commonality is presence is necessary presence is crucial and then we each have different challenges around not being present <laughs> um, and and adults just have a different set of barriers youth have their own set of barriers um, but you know there there's there's certainly opportunities to to share and share space and time um, in that way and then this is where the customizing the structure to who's present um, is 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 the unique opportunity and then that's that's what a democratic process versus a different kind of process opens up is the possibility of valuing the time honoring each other really bringing it uh, into I'm not sure how to say it but but really really bringing it together and and bringing people together and saying okay and, and, and being open to the question of who are we and how are we in this world right now, not assuming that it's a certain way or it's a certain thing or it's academic or it's not academic or it's, you know, like putting our labels on it. That's the adult curse is mm -hmm. we have all the labels for everything. Um, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, compartmentalizing and saying, oh, you're that label and I'm this label and, you know, um, as opposed to, I, I think the mature adult perspective is, is yes, there's a category. There's a racial category. There's a gender category. There's an academic category. And, you know, there's, you know, we, we have all the categories. And the adult perspective is not defined by the categories and being particularly sophisticated about them, although that's one of the adult things we do, is to say, and yet there's something deeper and more important than the categories that I can you know, speak. Uh, there's something deeper where I can be present to you and who you are and that I can't categorize that. That's beyond my words. I have to be present to you and learn who you are and not be confused by the labels you showed me. <laughs> you, 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 your words at me are not the same thing either. You know, like there's something beyond that uh, is that we recognize something deeper on in each other mm -hmm. in that way and when you do that depth of recognition it helps you to better prioritize needs mm. needs needs can often be hidden yeah and and what connects us is our commonalities of basic human needs um mm -hmm. That's something that's been resonating with me the last year a lot, especially as our community has gone through not just structural changes, but, but physical changes as well. I think right. I mentioned that we um, moved into our new space and restoration plaza earlier this year in January. We started the first part of the school year off without a home. Wow. Uh, we were teaching outside and in public libraries and in recreation centers, and it was because we, we sold our building in order to, to make structural changes that were beneficial oh, wow. to our community, like raising staff salaries and providing stronger programming for our young people. And wow. we, we had put a contract on a building that fell through right before mm. the start of the school year because the physical space um, was not approved. The certificate of occupancy wasn't approved. And so mm. um, I watched this community stay connected with one another through, um, through some I mean, being even even as a as a as a community, school community, being without a home is trauma is can be traumatizing, and I watched them pull together in order to prioritize needs deeply, mm. um, to to care for one another so that we could stick together, mm. mm -hmm. and this community did that. It was amazing to watch, wow. especially as you know, an educator joining them for the full first year. Yeah, wow. um, I got to spend a few months at the tail end of their previous school year in their old building, um, mm -hmm. which was very unique to to watch how the the structures without the 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 the, the verbal and the emotional structures mm -hmm. continued without the physical structure. Right, and right. <laughs> this, year, this year transitioned, but being present beca became not just a priority but a necessity, so mm -hmm. that we could learn 
the deep needs where they were, where they weren't being met Mm -hmm. in order to, to, to prioritize and, and uplift them beyond Mm -hmm. Maslow's basic hierarchy of needs that couldn't be recognized. (laughs) And that we try to point out to our students does connect us all. So when someone's screaming, no, I need the eraser with the pink top on it. I need that. (laughs) And it's like, well, okay, let's, there's 15 other pencils that are here. We need air, food, water, shelter, love, Mm -hmm, ability mm -hmm. to lay waste. Do you need that pencil right now? Or since it's just to put your name on the paper, could we possibly give this pencil to someone else whose fingers are a little smaller Mm -hmm. and you use this pencil instead just for now? And then next week, we'll look at trying to get you another one of these pencils, or maybe you can ask this friend to trade. Mm, mm, and mm-hmm. it, it it helps them go i mean okay just for now miss Courtney. <laughs> it's, it's really it's really magical to watch um mm-hmm. they they negotiate these big feelings of need and right. and how to how to prioritize those for themselves and with others mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. And I think you 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 stated it you stated it really well with uh, with the with the need for adults and their their categories and their labels um, mm-hmm. as to how we we prioritize needs and I think in the outside world sometimes we end up doing more to hide to hide mm-hmm. deep, deep needs rather than re- reveal them. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm with those although um i will say there is when we get to the place where we can we can categorize things with with diminishing judgment ever diminishing Mm. judgment where a label doesn't need to mean have 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 um uh nuanced meaning to it it doesn't need to have a, a a connotation that implies anything it just it, it is the category that it is. Right. Um, right. Then um, naming something helps us to talk about it. It helps us hold right. it. And particularly when we can allow um, young people the agency to name a thing mm-hmm. themselves. Well, that was sharing. I think that was right. sharing. <laughs> um, I, I, think, I think this is discrimination when Mm -hmm. we can label it together we can talk about it and Mm -hmm. um paulo freire's um pedagogy of the oppressed is really present for Mm -hmm. me with that Mm -hmm. um where it's not just as simple as putting a label on it it's it's agreeing to what that meaning is and and um Mm -hmm whenever possible, allowing people, and especially young people, to name that on their own, to, to, defi- mm-hmm. to, to define those, those, those words, those labels for themselves. Once they can put a name on something, then they can mm-hmm. hold it. We can, and then we can, we can hold a discussion about it together. Right, right. It, it, hold a discussion and also have that um that supportive so, so you have also when you identify something that is a challenge to yourself or another or or to the community you also then have the supporting structures of restorative justice and democratic process to negotiate not only the meaning of the word but then what needs to happen in order to you know really change what's happening, change how people are showing up in the space. Um, Because I think that's a crucial point that some people miss, is that it's not just a label, like taking discrimination, uh, you know, whether it be race, gender, abilities, or whatever, is that there's a there's a missing piece that 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 what gets the headlines is, you know, you're accused somebody of, 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 you know, racism or or sexism or something 
That gets the headline, but what needs to happen more deeply is within the community a conversation of, okay, let's accept that, and what needs to be different? Like, like what, what is the root of that, and how do we ensure that that's not the, the pattern that pl continues to play out? And that's where I think the, the, particularly the combination of democratic and restorative practice is particularly strong because you have, if, if the, the, the naming of that is centered on a conflict, you have a restorative practice to say, how is it actually showing up? What is the experience of it? What needs to be done differently? Who needs to act differently in the situation? But then you also have the democratic structure that says we can think bigger about not just how me and you are interacting on that, maybe around that label, but how do we as a community more deeply address that and say, well, maybe, maybe there's some way, some way that, that we need to alter how we operate on a day-to-day -day basis, like as a whole, not just as me and you. And so those two things together have two different ways of addressing whatever comes up. And, and, and one of the things about um, labels is that they are a division. They divide things one from another. And if we label each other relentlessly, we just simply divide from each other. And so part of what needs to go be, it, be beyond just the labeling is to get back to those relationships and not just, you know, once again, it's, it's sort of restorative is at that interpersonal level, but the democratic process at the organizational level and, and even as a community how do we show up in the world in a way that that can address it outside of our school one of the I uh, volunteered a, uh, at the village free school during the Occupy movement I happen to be volunteer there and um, and they had a whole camp you know encampment at the Occupy in P Portland because they had kids who said you know, we resonate with what they're saying, and so we want to be there to have the conversation about what this means. Um, and so they were there for, gosh, it was, I mean, I think they were cleared out after 45 days or so, but they were there probably 30, 30 you know, like for a long time. They actually set up a small library. They set up, uh, they ensured that there were children's, uh, children, you know, age-appropriate activities going on within the encampment. I mean, it was just an, kind of an incredible thing. Um, e independent of whether anybody agrees with the politics of the, of the occupation itself, mm -hmm. the fact that these young people, and it was a vote of the community to participate. It was not, you know, some adult saying we should take a bunch of kids there. It wasn't a bunch of kids saying we should just go there. It was the community agreeing we're going to have a presence there and show up for a larger community. And so that was a really powerful thing to me to like, you know, okay, they, they organized it, they made it happen. And then, and they par participated in the dialogue uh, in, in really appropriate ways. Um, so, so that's a really, they're, they're having those different levels available and, and, and interacting, I think is where it really, th th I think that's a magic to what the free schools can be at their best. So yeah, <laughs> um, so so let's roll it back a little bit here. <laughs> um, and if if the uh, thing freezes, don't worry, it's recording on your end and my end, and it'll you froze for me for there for a moment. Um, and at the end, there's a little bit of process afterwards, so let me I'll edit that part out. Okay, um, okay. so. What's one of the things that actually let, let's let's kind of uh, uh, come back in where we started? Um, tell me a story about a particular challenge. Well, you've actually already told one challenge. It was just the you know the change with the building and and rear and everything else. Um, so either elaborate on that one or or talk about you know a particular challenge that has really helped either a student grow or the school grow, uh, a challenge that they faced and then have grown as a result of. Mm. 
I think the presence of um, our recent memory <laughs> of of this transition is is really hard to ignore in terms of how it's it, it's shaping us currently. So I'll mm. I'll stay there. Um, but one of the one of the things that I think is important in in environments like this is uh, care of the community and agreement on what that looks like and one of the challenges that we had at the old building um, mm. which if you're familiar with brownstones in in, in Brooklyn um, they are they are often what you think of as kind of tall and skinnies all oh, right mm. um, uh, residences uh, they they can they can structurally in residential neighborhoods look a little bit like um, little mini mansions because um, mm. the, the rows of them are, are obviously so impressive and they, they um, come in so many different um, shapes and, and forms of, of architecture. They're beautiful, but ours was very old. Mm. <laughs> our, our little building was, was very old. It had been around for, for quite some time and it was a converted home from what, mm. from what I understand. Um, and brownstones, uh, in Brooklyn, given given their his um, their historical nature, often can be challenging to renovate. Mm -hmm. And that building that building had not been renovated since their since their moving in. Mm -hmm. And I think when it becomes challenging to make deep deep structure changes to a building, um, it also can become challenging to maintain and care yeah. for for some of those structures and and so it's hard to it's hard to say clean up a a, a, a bin of magnetiles mm. when the the shelf that you're store you're getting ready to store them on is starting to fall apart off the wall <laughs> you're kind of inclined to be like man well I'll just shove it in the corner and, and right. let it go um which uh which was which presents a, a the practical challenge of how do you you know keep track of your materials and ensure that student work is is safe and mm -hmm. um and protected and able and able to be stored one of the 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 highlights of moving into this environment um and going through our the transitions that we have this last year has been opening up conversations about how we agree to caring for our environment um, and and protecting our resources um, as as we want to make them last and and to help us take care of our educational environment for the future for the next mm -hmm. few years to come and so that transition is revealing the need for those conversations to reflect what individuals needs are in order to participate in the learning environment um mm -hmm. you know do you need do you need cleanliness do you need a little bit of chaos in order to do your best work <laughs> um do you need quiet do you need loud do you need one-on-one -on -one? do you need group do you need solo that's self that's 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 prepared an environment for self guided instruction. Um, do you need a mix of materials all in one space? Do you need for them to be separated? Um, how how high up do you need for them to be stored, mm. or how how low down? Mm -hmm. um, and using those conversations ever more as an opportunity to shape this this space around our young people. Um, and and it's an area of challenge for me. Mm. Um, I am I'm not, I, I'm not just a community organizer. I'm an I'm an I'm an organizer of stuff. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> this is a vestige of old and um, and one that um, my my family I feel like was it was it was like, now I see it very much as a gift to me, but um, one that you know, may not have been as prioritized for other people in, in their households or their, their um, development, their environments of development. And so coming together to talk about truly, like, what do we need? Mm -hmm. What do 
we need um, in order to get something done. And then agreeing on what that something is helps mm -hmm. us better structure our space. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it is an ongoing challenge because right. people's needs for structure change from moment to moment, week to week, year to year. Um, and then we obviously attract new community members every year. And what they need then influences changes to the environment. So keeping up with that um, along with an, a resource assessment um, and, mm -hmm. and what we have available to us is a challenge that we welcome um, and it provides problem solving opportunities that n not only bring us closer together, but mm -hmm. grow us as individuals and, and grow our students academically. Um, because when we look at a blank wall in the space and we go, the, wow, this looks so blank. And so, <laughs> you know, we've got to do, what should we, what should we do with it? What should go on that wall? Either, mm -hmm. you know, like physically, should, should we move bookshelves and tables over there? Or, or should we paint, should we paint a mural here? Mm -hmm. um, our students get to say, well, I, I'm a visual artist and, um, it's hard for for me to 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 see create creativity when I'm not reflected in it. I would like to see faces go onto this wall, or mm. um, you know, I I want the ability to be able to to spin around a couple of times once I've finished with the, with an activity. And having a kitchenette and an art table and the, our our slime bucket in here doesn't give me the space to do that. So we need to move mm. those centers outside of the room. Um, and, uh, and we have that, that flexibility now that we are in a, a new space and we are in the process, the, the ongoing process of develop, of developing it. We're building walls inside of, inside mm. of this, this space where we're adding, um, uh, insulation to, to, to classrooms in order to create sound barriers where, um, where the, uh, teachers are getting help from students to physically lift bookshelves in order to create nooks and nooks and cubbies and mm -hmm. and um you know we're raising the height of our chairs and tables or lowering them in order to to fit where are our students so it's like oh well so and so had a growth spurt over the summer and now <laughs> that standing desk that we got for them we've got to make sure to bump it up six inches so that they can mm -hmm. still stand at it how are we going to do that together um and and so those are those are challenges that if you're if you're at Brooklyn Free School, um, you're going to continue to welcome. Nice. Uh, and they help make us better. Nice. Well, that's perfect. That's because that really reflects the the conversational aspect of the school. The even the physical space is reflective of who has shown up, who is being present, and who's you know giving input to. How sh how should this space be? How should this space reflect who we are? Um, I really love that, um, you know, because it, it it emphasizes the dialogic of the whole process of the whole thing is is about um, honoring the growth spurt, you know, honoring you know the the need, the 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 the, the active ones, the the you know the artist and the the dancer and the you know whoever whoever whatever the needs are that show up that's that's how the space becomes to reflect that i mean i mean even giving up a building um and and making that i mean talk about big transformations uh you know just that's that is a, an incredible story in the way of of reflecting sort of you know collectively coming to a realization and then making such a dramatic change to answer it. Um, I mean, I, I think that's a really amazing sort of testament, uh, you know, a magnitude of of commitment to what you're up to. Um, I, I think that's, and, and that, uh, yeah, it's really, really cool. Um, so I think we'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up there. Um, well, I should before mention, we go, Don, yeah, I, please. I, I want to honor the, the people that came before that were mm. so instrumental in procuring that building. 
um, mm -hmm. maintaining it, um, and uh, and the folks that have the vision to to see the that that flexibility in the future, um, mm -hmm. and how that 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 current structure met the needs of the community at the time. Right. Um, right. Because there were so many wonderful hands. Uh, a part of that process, uh, Nolika Radway and um, and Alan Berger mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Lily Tomlin and um, oh gosh, I'm, I'm forgetting so many <laughs> names of, of people that that um, were that that held um, mm -hmm. that held that space held held yeah. and and maintained those structures and created them them for us and uh, exactly without, without whom. You know, we would not be where we are today under the the direction and leadership of our our current ED, um, mm -hmm. Monique Scott, who yeah. um, is is establishing a pedagogy for for a transitional future, for a transition into the future, into the yeah. best future that that this school can experience. And I'm I'm proud to work uh, to have worked alongside many of these individuals and to mm -hmm. to still, to still develop and, and brainstorm and problem solve with them. Exactly. And and so so actually that's a great segue into what I was going to ask you anyway is uh, give us the the kind of uh, you know the the website the the contact information people need to reach out and they they can you know find out more about Brooklyn Free School. Yes, please. We we welcome you to to come by and and visit us um, either physically or, or virtually. Um, if you're wanting to, to join us physically, again, we're, we're located at 1360 Restoration Plaza, um, right behind Applebee's in the heart of bed -Stuy, where uh, Little Sun people used to reside for, uh, mm. for at least a couple of decades, uh, as far as I know. It's another fixture of, uh, of uh, an, uh, an early childhood program in, mm. in Brooklyn. Um, and if you're wanting to visit us digitally, digitally, you can do so at www.brooklynfreeschool.org. Again, it's brooklynfreeschool.org. Um, we have social media presence on Facebook and Instagram. And uh, we welcome you to follow us and, and be a part of our, our small school's journey. Awesome. And I'll have some more links in the description below the video on YouTube, and uh, we'll have other ways to connect as well. Uh, mm -hmm. So thank you again, Courtney. I really appreciate your time and, and, and enthusiasm for talking, um, and we'll call it a day. Thank you, Don. Appreciate thank you. Thank you.